to be with you. Good to be with those of you in the room. Uh, also good to be with those of you watching at home. As John said, we've reached Eat, and I think this is the best one. Uh, we've just been down uh, to Cornwall for a week, visiting family down there. And I have to say, I took this part of Blessed very, very seriously indeed. There were pasties and pizza and cottage pie, and I thought, if we're going to do this, let's do it properly. So I really went for it on that. So to recap, just in case you've got no idea what I'm talking about, we are in the middle of this series, Bless. And this is about taking Jesus' command to make disciples and making it part of our everyday lives, seeing ordinary moments as opportunities for mission. So we looked at the B, begin with prayer, about asking God who to put on our blessed list in the first place, and then committing to praying for those people persistently, knowing that there's power when we pray. And then last week, Ellie spoke into L, listen, listening to God for people, but also listening intently to people. And now we're on eat. And you know, this is so much more than just a series. Actually, many of us are here because we've met with Jesus in some way, haven't we? We've encountered Jesus and he's changed us and he is changing us and he's given us hope and he's given us life. Um, And he's placed us around people who don't yet know him, neighbours and work colleagues and family members and friends, people that we care deeply about. And the question that Bless addresses is, well, how do we invite these people to experience what we've experienced? How do we point these people to Jesus? And one option, of course, is that we don't. We just leave it to people who are very, very good at this. A proper evangelist like Greg Downs is going to come and speak over the next couple of weeks But maybe actually there's another option. Maybe there's a way of doing this that isn't complicated and isn't weird. Maybe there's a way of doing this like Jesus did it. So we're going to get into the Bible. Let me just say, I preached into this same topic of Eat Together four years ago when we first ran this Blessed series. And it really, really challenged me. It made me examine a couple of things. It made me examine my diary, so what I prioritise in my week. And it also made me examine my heart. Do I really care enough about the people that God has placed in my life? And of course, over the last few years, eating with people has been really difficult. We've had lockdowns and face masks and coffee shops and restaurants have been shut. And for a time, you couldn't eat with anyone who you didn't live with. But now as we come to this again, I'm really, really challenged to make this a priority again in my own life. I think what we're looking at today is something that's very, very ordinary, but at the same time something with power to change our own lives and change the lives of the people that we love. So we're in Matthew 9, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to it now. Matthew 9, verse 9. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry at all. The words will be on the screen. So Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And we're going to see Jesus here at his most radical and controversial best. He is turning the status quo on its head and really challenging the culture around him. So let's see what happens. It says this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for this word. I thank you for your living word, that it's alive and that it has power to speak to us today. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here with us. And I ask you to speak to us, Lord. I pray you'd speak to us in this time. I thank you that you know us. I pray you'd encourage us and you'd challenge us. And Father, that you'd use this word to make us more like Jesus. And we ask that, Lord, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at three very simple things to do with this passage and to do with eating together. So first of all, how did Jesus do it? How we can do it? 
and why this matters. So first of all, how did Jesus do it? Let's look at this passage. Jesus is walking along and he sees this tax collector, Matthew. And most commentators agree that this is the gospel writer, Matthew, writing a first-hand account of this meeting. Matthew is at work. He's in his office, likely a small customs and excise booth somewhere near Capernaum. And Jesus walks up to him and says, follow me. And the next scene we see is Jesus in Matthew's house, eating a meal. And that's odd, isn't it? Jesus says, follow me. And the next thing you know, they're having dinner together at Matthew's place. And Jesus did this a lot. Jesus seemed to have this wonderful knack of inviting himself to other people's houses. And you see this in the story of Zacchaeus as well in Luke 19. Zacchaeus is another tax collector who's intrigued by Jesus. Jesus is going past him. Zacchaeus climbs a tree so he can see Jesus. What does Jesus say to Zacchaeus? He says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. One thing is very, very clear in all this. Jesus is not British. We wouldn't do that. See, if, you, if, you're, if you're from another culture or if you've experienced life in another part of the world, you'll know that in many parts of the world, actually, this would be considered very normal. You can do that. You can turn up at a friend's house uninvited and they will welcome you in. They might even invite you to sit down and have a meal with them and that might be the whole afternoon gone. We're not very good at that here. If you do that here, you might get some very suspicious looks. You might get your friend kind of frantically checking their phone to see if they've missed an appointment that, that you made with them. We're not so good at that. But actually, we can miss this in a Western culture, but in the context that Jesus lived in, as it still is in many, many parts of the world today, eating together is about so much more than just food. A shared meal represents friendship and community. A meal is a powerful expression of welcome and inclusion. To eat with someone is to say, I want to be associated with this person. And that is why what Jesus is doing here is so challenging. Because who does Jesus eat with? Well, here he's eating in the home of a tax collector. And it's not just Matthew who's there. The passage says that many other tax collectors and sinners showed up at Matthew's house for this meal. And it's really, really important that we understand how tax collectors were seen in this society. They really were the lowest of the low. Israel was occupied and oppressed by the Roman Empire, and tax collectors were Jewish people who worked for the Romans. And they were known to be corrupt. They added their own fee on to Rome's tax. So they were seen by the Jews as selling out their own people. And Jesus is eating with them. On top of that, you've got other sinners at this meal. And that word sinners there could mean anything. It might mean prostitutes or other people who would have been considered on the lower rungs of the moral ladder in that time. But it might also include ordinary people who weren't following the strict law that the Pharisees enforced. Now I want you just to picture that meal for a moment. Just try and picture it in your mind. You've got this table of people from all walks of life eating together. Let's not sanitize this scene. I see this as a noisy scene, a, a joyful scene perhaps. People sharing stories together, laughter and jokes and the wine flowing. And where is Jesus? Well, he's right there in the middle of it. See, sinners and tax collectors seem to like being around Jesus. And we know that Jesus never shied away from challenge. So what was it about this man? Well, surely they saw in him a man of great compassion and warmth and grace. A man who didn't shy away from truth, but who listened to them, and who was interested in their lives. And the Pharisees don't like it at all. In fact, they're outraged by this. See, to them, what Jesus is doing is very, very dangerous. And they say to Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, what is it that these Pharisees object to? Well, here's the problem. To them, Jesus is mixing with the wrong crowd. See, meals were boundary markers. Meals brought people together, but they also kept people apart. Somewhere along the way, the Pharisees had missed the gracious heart of God. And so the Pharisees were all about avoidance. They feared being tainted by uncleanness, and so they kept themselves away. 
A Jewish rabbi in that culture would never be caught dead in the home of someone like Matthew. You just can't do that. In the Pharisees' view, Jesus ought to have known better, but Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. I love what Jesus says to the Pharisees. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Why did Jesus spend so much time eating with sinners? It's because he understood the mission he was on. He understood his purpose. Jesus laid out that purpose, that mission, really well in the story of Zacchaeus. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And the self-righteous, those who think they've got it all together, would totally miss this. Jesus came for those who realised that apart from God, they're nothing. They are broken. They are lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man came for that purpose, to seek and save the lost. And what was his strategy for reaching those people? Well, often it was by eating and drinking with people. There's another sentence in the Gospels that begins, The Son of Man came. And it's in Matthew 11, Jesus describing himself. He says, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, Jesus was no drunkard. He was no glutton. But he did have a reputation for eating with sinners. His mission was to seek and save the lost. And his strategy, much of the time, was eating with them. If you look through the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus spent a lot of time eating. Robert Karras writes this, that in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. I love that. The author Tim Chester writes, Jesus didn't run projects, establish ministries, create programs, or put on events. He ate meals. See, for Jesus, meals were a sign of God's great welcome into the kingdom. Not a way to keep people out, but a way to invite people in. Meals mattered to Jesus because people mattered to Jesus. And so he wasn't afraid to take on the religious leaders and show their self-righteousness for what it was. He wasn't afraid to cross boundaries to go after the people that he loved. He came to seek and save the lost, and that meant that he shared life with them and he ate with them. How about us? So here's the challenge. What does who we eat with say about us? What does who we eat with say about the mission that we have and the purpose that we feel our life is about? Do we only eat and drink with people who are like us and who believe the same things that we do? Now, we need Christian community and fellowship. We need one another, especially in the times that we've been through. I remember when we came out of the first lockdown in 2020, being able to eat with people again, the simple joy of being able to sit with our close Christian friends in their garden and just have lunch with them. If the church is family, then spending time together outside of Sunday mornings is so important. But are we also intentional about spending time with people outside the church, people who aren't Christians? And I don't just mean a passing conversation. I mean trying to get to that next level of sitting down with them and having a coffee or a meal. Are we following Jesus in who we eat with? What if we saw our dinner tables as a key place for making disciples? And that doesn't necessarily mean reaching out to people on the fringes of society. It might mean that. But it will likely mean sitting down with people who have a completely different worldview to us. Maybe actually this is our best hope of reaching people. Zach Nielsen is a church pastor in the States. He writes this, In today's culture, people tend to be less trusting of churches. So they may not show up to our Sunday gatherings, but most of them would show up to our dining room tables. I often tell our church that, humanly speaking, their table might be the most powerful place for evangelism in the 21st century. Now, we work really hard to make these Sunday meetings accessible to people, whatever their beliefs, that people can come as they are and experience the acceptance and the love of God. And if you're here today, or if you're watching today and you're not yet a Christian, you're exploring faith, I want you to know that you're so welcome. I trust you've experienced the welcome of God here. But, you know, some people just won't come, not straight away anyway. 
For many people, meetings like this, in places like this, are really, really difficult for all kinds of reasons. But actually, an invitation to a meal is different. It's very different. So why do we find this hard? And you may do this brilliantly already. I'm, I'm very aware as I'm speaking that I'm speaking as, a, as an English introvert. And you may regularly have people over for meals. You may regularly go for coffee with people and see lives transformed for Jesus. But in case I'm not the only one who struggles with this, what stops us from doing this more? I think for me, one of the biggest things is time. So in the busyness of our lives, we don't always like to give a lot of time to meals. Meals can slow us down. A recent survey showed the average British dinner lasts just 21 minutes. Some of you are thinking, actually, that's quite a long time. Maybe, maybe that kind of proves the point. We don't, we don't like to give too much time to meals. And yet, in our busy culture, people are crying out for richer, more meaningful relationships. And meals are a great context for relationships to be built. Food is passed around. Questions are asked. Stories are told. Problems are shared. And we can say we don't have the time for this, but actually Jesus commands us to go and make disciples in full knowledge that there are 24 hours in each day and only seven days in each week. Again, blessed isn't about doing more, it's about being more intentional. Most of us will eat around 21 meals this week. What if we looked at these 21 meals and thought, could I use one of these meals for mission? Could I sit and have lunch with a work colleague? Could I invite the neighbours over for a Saturday breakfast? If you're a bit, a bit younger, could you have lunch with someone in your school or go for a coffee with someone on a university course? For some of us, the best response today will be a practical one. It will be to look at our diaries for the next week or two and to think, which meal could I turn into an opportunity for mission? I think time can be a barrier in this. What else? I think, I think there's a vulnerability actually involved in eating with people. See, it's one thing praying for people. Listening to people might require a bit more intentionality, but actually sitting down and eating with someone involves being more open about who we really are. It involves giving more of ourselves, especially if that is in our own home. We can ask those questions in our minds. When people see the real me, what will they see? What kind of witness will my life be to Jesus? What will people think of the food in our home? What if my kids start arguing during the meal and I have to tell them off? What will people think of the way that I parent? By inviting someone into our home, we're making ourselves vulnerable. And actually, there's a power in that. Because there's a vast difference, isn't there, between entertaining and hospitality. See, the word entertaining suggests putting on a show like it's some kind of performance where our goal is to impress people with our cooking and our conversation. And that can be really, really hard work. But hospitality is different. The goal of hospitality is to love people. Hospitality is about being generous with what we have, with our food and our homes and our lives, even if what we have isn't very much. Knowing that actually it's all a gift from God. And meals are a great leveler. As we sit down with people around the table at the same level, eating food that God provided meeting people where they're at, just loving people. And many of you are brilliant at this. And you know, sharing a meal like this is a great way of saying, look, I, I don't have it all together either. But actually, I know Jesus and he is changing me. And the truth is, if you're trying to follow Jesus, you're likely a much better witness than you think you are. You'll reflect much more of Jesus than you know. Rosaria Butterfield writes a book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. I really like this book, really challenging me right now. The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And just to give a bit of background, Rosaria was a, a lesbian feminist, a leader in LGBTQ rights, and an academic. She's the kind of person who perhaps if you, if you put her on your list, you might be thinking, well, Lord, this, this might not be easy. I'm, I'm praying for her, but it might not be easy. And, and years ago, she was writing a paper about how Christians marginalize people like her. And as part of her research, she went for a meal at the home of a Christian couple called Ken and Floyd. And she had so many preconceptions about what that couple and what that meal would be like. But she says this about that first meal. 
She says, nothing about that night unfolded according to my confident script. Nothing happened in the way I expected. Nothing prepared me for this openness and truth. Nothing prepared me for the unstoppable gospel and for the love of Jesus made manifest by the daily practices of hospitality undertaken in this one simple Christian home. And over the years, this couple, Ken and Floyd, invited Rosaria in for hundreds more meals. And they sat and ate with her. And they walked with her. And she says they wouldn't let go of her. They accepted her without approving of her lifestyle. And they showed her the love of Jesus. A love that ultimately led to her salvation and a transformed life. And she now writes this. Radically ordinary hospitality. Those who live it see strangers as neighbours and neighbours as family of God. They recoil at reducing a person to a category or a label. They see God's image reflected in the eyes of every human being on earth. They take their own sin seriously, including the sin of selfishness and pride. They take God's holiness and goodness seriously. They use the Bible as a lifeline with no exceptions. Those who live out radically ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. They open doors. They seek out the underprivileged. They know that the gospel comes with a house key. I find that really, really challenging. And I know that inviting people into your home like this doesn't work for everyone. I get that. The situation that you're in, the people that you live with, the season of life that you're in. And I think we have to know ourselves in this too. We have to know what drains us and what fills us. If we do this to the point where it burns us out, we can become bitter about it and resent it. And that's why it's so important to keep coming back and sitting at Jesus' feet for ourselves and spending time with him and loving people out of his love for us. But for me, what makes this so challenging is that it's not complicated It's that it's ordinary. I don't need to learn more to practice bless. I need to love more. I need to capture God's heart for my family members and my friends and my neighbours. And then to think, well, what could I do to sit down and eat with these people? What could you do? I wonder what barriers are there for you and how, how might you be able to overcome them in the weeks ahead? If cost is an issue, just keep it simple and keep it cheap. If it doesn't work to have people in your home, then just go for a coffee. Or better still, just do what Jesus did and invite yourself over to someone else's house. You might get some funny looks, but you might get a free free meal out of it as well. So finally, why does all this matter? Well, have you noticed how often in the Bible salvation is pictured as a feast? The story of the prodigal son, this son who squandered everything, he shamed his family, He comes home and the dad throws a party. He celebrates because his lost son is found again. See, when the lost are found, there's always a party. And a good party always involves food. In Revelation 19, the disciple John is given a vision of heaven. He writes, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. The wedding supper of the Lamb. There is a wedding feast coming. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then you you are on the guest list. Your name is on that guest list. How did your name get on that guest list? Was it down to your own righteousness? No, it all comes down to Jesus. It's all because Jesus came close. It's all because God didn't distance himself from you, but he came close. He got involved. He came down to the pit of our lives and into our mess. We were the tax collectors. We were the sinners. We were the sick people in need of a doctor. And Jesus came after us and invited us to know him and experience relationship with him. And at the cross, Jesus took the punishment for your sin and my sin. And he threw wide the invitation to heaven. And if you've not met Jesus yet, he invites you today to know his grace. He invites you to know this God who gave himself for you. He invites you into relationship with him and to be part of that great eternal wedding feast. See, when Jesus eats with the tax collectors and sinners, the message is clear. The invitation is for all. 
He came for ordinary people like you and me and all those people on your blessed list. I don't know about you, but I want those people on my blessed list, the people I know who don't yet know Jesus, I want them to spend eternity with me and with Jesus forever and ever and ever. I want them to be at that great eternal feast. And only Jesus can save them. But what if we learn from the way that Jesus reached out to people? See, there's a place for structured apologetics and great teaching. Of course there is. But what I see from Jesus is that making disciples is about doing life with people. It's about praying for people, listening to them, and then eating with them. I can do that. You can do that. So as I finish, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Maybe that is not as complicated as it sounds. We don't even have to go very far. All nations, many nations are right here on our doorstep. To reach out the Jesus way. We don't need a church event or initiative. We just need a table, a bit of food, and a love for people. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, and he did it by eating and drinking. And now he says, follow me and do the same. So let's go out there and eat for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good.